Okay, so let's begin by greeting everyone who is attending the class. Okay, so just to clarify a few things in the beginning, obviously we would like to speak about the subject matter of this text or the teachings, which is going to be the Lamarim. So we will just give a brief overview of that. But there is one thing to clarify. Now, Geshe-la is saying that I don't want you to feel that you are obliged to enter a formal relationship as students and teachers, a teacher in this occasion. So we're just coming here to benefit each other. You can listen to the advice or the instructions. If you find that beneficial, that's excellent. Then at the end, you ask some questions and that's of benefit the teacher so that's it so i guess i want to clarify why i say that we should not establish a formal relationship of student and teacher because if you were to establish such a relationship the teacher who is teaching you the lam rim should be someone who is fully qualified fully qualified in the sense of having the experience. And Geshe-la says, I don't have any deep Lamrim experiences. Up to now, I have been studying here and teaching in the monastery, just the usual subjects. So, of course, I can speak about the subject of Lamrim, but I'm not qualified in the sense of having deep Lamrim experiences. And therefore, I'm saying that we're not going to establish this formal relationship, but we can have the recognition of Dharma friends amongst us. Okay, so why are we having teachings today, which is Sunday? So the request uh, was um, made to Geshe-la to, to give this Lamrim teaching a couple of weeks ago, and he agreed to do that, but he thought that it would be best to commence the teachings on a day where we had favorable um, ast uh, astrological combination. So Geshe-la checked this, and he found that today, Sunday, was the, more favor the most favorable combination of the stars and the planets, and it's always very auspicious to start a teaching activity on an auspicious day. So this is why we're starting today. It will not be a full class. It will be one hour. And during this one hour, Geshe would like to introduce the general subject matter of the Lamrim to understand what the Lamrim is all about. And then to talk, of course, you know, about the author or the lineage of the Lamrim, the different Lamrim texts that we have within the Geluk tradition we recognize the eight Lamrim texts. So those Geshe would like to introduce those things. And at the end, we have 15 minutes of questions and answers. So from next week, we will start the regular classes. There will be classes twice a week. Now, we said that the teaching is going to be the Lamrim. And Geshe said it's good to have a text as a reference text, right? We say we're going to base the teachings on these texts. So we mentioned there are eight Lamarim texts, and uh, from those, we, Geshe has chosen what is called the easy path, the easy Lamarim path. It's a short, concise text, so it is very useful. Again, we're not going to follow exactly every word of the text, but we will follow the structure of the text according to the outlines, and this will guide us through the text. So as we said, this is a short text. So once we finish this, if there is still interest and enthusiasm, we can continue with the Lamrim, either with the middle-length Lamrim or the great exposition of the stages of the path, the Lamrim Chemo. So let's just see. Well, let's start with the short one and let's see how it goes. So let's start first of all with the title of the text. Uh, this is called the Lamrim or the Graduated Stages to Enlightenment. So if you look at that, enlightenment refers to the final object of attainment, what we wish to attain. So this is Buddhahood. So this is the enlightenment part. And then the Lam Rim actually translates as the stages of the path. So it presents the methods that are suitable according to the three types of individuals that we have. So it is a presentation of the stages uh, of different methods that different types of individuals follow in order to reach the final state of enlightenment. Okay, so we, um, we say that we want to trace the origin 
of this of this teaching the origin of this teaching has to be an authentic teaching that we're able to trace all the way to um, go back into the our um, teacher Buddha Shakyamuni and that is based on the teaching that Buddha gave in uh, Rajgir Mountain when he taught the Prajnaparamita text the extensive the middling and the short so this is the sutric uh, foundation of these teachings when we look at uh, the teachings of the Prajnaparamita, the, the mother sutras, we see that we have an explicit teaching and the explicit subject matter is the prof profound path of emptiness. And then we have hidden teachings, which is on the method aspect. So for the explicit, the profound path of emptiness, these teachings were passed from Venerable Manjushri to Master Nagarjuna, from Master Nagarjuna to Masters Aryadeva, Buddha Bhalita, Chantrakirti, and down to Master Atisha. As for the other aspect, which is the hidden aspect of the teachings in the Prasna Paramita um, text, we have uh, the extensive practices, and this came down through um, the Venerable Matriya to Master Asanga, from Master Asanga eventually down to Master Selimpa, and from Master Selimpa they arrived to, to Master Atisha. In this way we see that Atisha actually received the complete set of both those lineages of instructions. So as we see, Master Atisha actually received the complete set of instructions from both lineages. Master Atisha was um, actually residing in Nalanda Monastery and Vikramalashila nearby. And eventually we know how he was invited to Tibet uh, by Jamchum Ur and Yeshe Ur. They offered, uh, uh, they made great efforts to invite Master Atisha to Tibet and they offered as much gold as they could uh, gather. And there were many sacrifices to get him into Tibet. Once in Tibet, Master Atisha taught, and most uh, importantly, he composed the very famous text, The Lamp to the Path to Enlightenment. So that particular text now became the first text that, that was um, attributed the title of a Lamrim text. Okay, so uh, that text has become the foundation or the origin of many other subsequent texts that are composed as commentaries to that text and are considered to be the Lamarin texts. So, if we want to talk about the origin of the Lamarin text, we say it goes back to Master Atisha's Lamp to the Path, and that is traced back to the teachings of the Buddha, the three Prajna Paramitas, the extensive, the middling, and the condensed. And then following that, as we say, we have a long series, a long tradition of commentaries or Lamrim teachings. And in the Geluk tradition, we mentioned that there are eight of those famous Lamrim texts. Okay, so let's uh, enumerate those eight um, Lamrim texts in the Geluk tradition. Beginning with uh, Lama Tsongkhapa, we have the three Lamrims. We have the extensive, the great Lamrim. We have the middle length Lamrim and we have the short Lamrim. Then uh, we have uh, the Lamrim from uh, the Panchen Lama Los Angeles, which is the swift path. We have another Lamrim from another Panchen Lama, Choki Gelsen, which is the easy path that we will be following. Then we have uh, a Lamrim from the third Dalai Lama, Sonam Gyatso, the essence of refined gold. And we have another Lamrim from the fifth Dalai Lama, the great Manjushri's own words. And then finally, we have a Lamrim from uh, Ngawang Dragpa of Dagpo, which is called the Path of Excellent Scripture. 
So uh, just a little bit of the introduction about, we mentioned the three Lamrim texts by Lama Tsongkhapa, and in particular the Lamrim Chenmo, the great exposition of the stages of the path. Lama Tsongkhapa pursued his studies in the central area of Tibet in Dome for many years. And when he reached the age of 46, he began the composition of Lamrim Chenmo. He was in the area in the area of Tolum, where together he met with Master Rendawa. They had a close relationship, disciple and teacher to each other. So there they met and they enter into the summer retreat. And when the summer retreat also was um, released, and during the summer retreat, they both of them engaged in a great series of teachings that were of great benefit to many and propagated the text in a great way. Now, at that time, Lama Tsongkhapa started uh, petitioning all the great uh, lineage masters of the Lam Rim. And he petitioned them so fervently and so frequently that he started having visions of all of them. And at uh, the end, there, at that time, there was actually he had a statue of Master Atisha. And uh, on a particular day, he had a particular, a very clear vision. In that vision, he saw Master Atisha, he saw Drum Tompa, he, he saw Master Potawa, Sarawa, and all the other great Lamrim uh, masters, but it, particularly those four figures. And he saw all of them gradually dissolving into that statue, into the figure of Atisha. And then Master Atisha actually placed his hand on Lama Tsongkhapa's head and he said, you should compose these stages of the path to enlightenment. That will be of great benefit to sentient beings. So in that sense, he received the blessing but also you could say it was the request or the encouragement that came from Master Atisha himself to compose the Lamrim Chenmo, the great expositions, the great stages of the exposition of the path. And uh, the occasion is uh, remarkable, the text is remarkable, and the location in which he composed the text is also considered a very precious location. So once Lama Tsongkhapa decided that he would begin the composition, he also consulted with Manjushri. Lama Tsongkhapa had a very special relationship with Manjushri. He had direct uh, encounters of Manjushri, like meeting another human. So he had this relationship as a student with a direct teacher, and he received many profound and unique instructions from Manjushri. So when he was about to begin the composition of Lamrim Chenmo, he of course he said to Manjushri, by the way, I'm beginning composition of Lamrim Chenmo. And Manjushri replied back to him in a casual, sort of like as a joke, and he said, what? I have told you renunciation, bodhicitta and correct view. What more would you need to write about? Um, but it was in a joking way. And of course, again, Manjushri gave his blessings and encouragement uh, to Lama Tsongkhapa to commence that project. So Lama Com Tsongkhapa composed the text up to the point to the end of calm abiding. So before entering the section of special insight, he stopped and he had a brief... Uh, sort of like break and at that time he had a doubt whether he should write this section on special insight whether it would be of benefit to send him beings but again manjushri came and gave him further specific encouragement and blessing for this last section and after the short break that lama Tsongkhapa had he continued the composition and finished the entire lama Rin. Then later on, at the age of 59, Lama Tsongkhapa went to Ganden Monastery, and there he composed his second Lamrim text, which is the middling length of the Lamrim, because the, very, the extensive Lamrim, as the title indicates, 
uh, has quite a lot of detail. So the intermediate lamrin that he composed takes the most essential parts of the practice. So in that sense, it is condensed and from extensive, he went into the intermediate. So at the age of 55 at Ganden Monastery. Sorry, not 55, 59, at the age of 59. So uh, these two texts that Lama Tsongkhapa composed, the extensive Lamrim and the uh, middle length Lamrim, they became the basis uh, or the starting point for all the other Lamrims uh, that we mentioned. So then we mentioned the essence of refined gold, Manjushri's own words, the easy path, the swift path, the excellent, um, the, the path of excellent scriptures, also Papon Karimboche's uh, liberation in the palm of your hand. We have a great number of uh, commentaries, uh, shorter and longer commentaries of the Lamrim, and they are all based on the two original texts of Lama Tsongkhapa, the Lamrim Chenmo and the Middle Length Lamrim. So I guess I was saying, I'm sure the majority of the people who are listening today, uh, you already have uh, received Lamrim teachings. You probably know those things. So it is just like a little reminder just to freshen up your memory. But also I thought that there might be some new people and uh, for the, especially for the new people, I, I enumerated those eight Lamrim texts because you never know, you might get the interest and the inclination and decide, I really want to study Lamrim. And if I want to study Lamrim, well, you have the full list of eight texts. You can follow those. So Geshe was saying, just, just, uh, just a refreshing your memory, just a brief introduction. I'm sure most of you have heard those things before. So having explained the origin of this instruction of the text that we recognize as the Lam Rim or the graduated path to enlightenment, we have to understand that the Lam Rim text actually consolidates and includes all the instructions, all the presentation that we have even in the most extensive Prasnaparamita Sutras. So it is not lacking, it is not missing any instruction. Everything is included within the Lam Rim, the graduated path. Then we have the other term, which is graduated path to enlightenment. In, in terms of enlightenment, we have the enlightenment of the hearer, the enlightenment of the solitary realizer and the enlightenment of the great vehicle. So here it is understood as being the graduated path to the great vehicle enlightenment. So specific this. So in order to achieve this enlightenment of the great vehicle, it is in, important that the individual trains in the uncommon path of, of the individual of the great scope. And in order to do that, it has to have gone through the training that is common to the individual of the middle scope. And in order to have this, it must have gone through the training that is common with the individual of the small scope. So if we want to, let's say, give a concise presentation, you can say that this text and all the Lamarin texts have exactly the same presentation, right? Um, the the essence of the Lam Rim is training common to the individual of the small scope, training of the individual of the intermediate, intermediate scope, and training of the individual of the great scope. That's what it is. Yeah. All right, so we gave a concise presentation of the Lam Rim, but there is an even easier way to explain this. So when we talk about the Lam Rim, it's like, why, why should we study the Lam Rim? We should study the Lamrim because we're all looking for physical and mental well-being. So when we talk about physical well-being, right, how we understand this is that if something goes wrong in terms of our body, the functions of the body, what we do is we go to the doctor and the doctor prescribes some medication and we take the medication and, you know, it, it, that balances whatever imbalance is in the body. So that's a physical aspect. But we also want to have a sense of well-being mentally. And the mental well-being or the mental happiness is not something that you can simply go to the doctor and the doctor can prescribe some medicine and you take the medicine and that cures your problem. Because the thing that upsets the mind 
is our afflictions. So we have things such as like our hatred, our ignorance, our attachment, we have jealousy, we have pride, uh, we have doubts and so forth. We are constantly tormented and made upset by the six root afflictions and then a big number of secondary afflictions. All right, so um, the best means, and you could say the best medicine to pacify the mind, to bring about that mental well-being that we all want to experience is the Lam Rim. If you study and understand the Lam Rim, and if you practice the Lam Rim, you will uh, have happiness in this life. Now, we know we can take care of the physical aspect, and if we can take care of the mental aspect as well, we will have a life that is meaningful. But not just this life, we will also see these results of happiness and well-being in the next life. So Geshe says, I take it here that you're all accepting the existence of past and future lives, even if you do not have the entire full faith and conviction. Let's take this as a basis. They are future lives. And if you do practice the Lam Rim, you will see the benefit, not just now, but in the future as well. So we are justified in saying that you will not find a medicine that is more suitable than the Lam Rim. So we said that in terms of the presentation or the structure of the Lam Rim, we begin by giving the practices that are shared with the individual of the small scope. So what are those practices? Basically, there are two practices. It's the going for refuge and uh, the law, of course, and result. Okay, so when we say that we're going for refuge, we recognize our uh, Buddha Shakyamuni as being the teacher. We recognize the Dharma as being the actual protection, the actual thing that protects us. And we recognize this Sangha as being our friends and aids along the path. And therefore we have faith in the three jewels. The faith that we have, it's a very specific faith. The faith that they have the capacity and the power to protect us from negativity we have created. And that negativity we have created has the power to propel us to, or to throw us to a life in the three unfortunate types of migrations. So basically what we say here is, if you, if you have any fear about the suffering that is involved in any of the three lower migrations, since you have created negativity to fall in there, then it is very good to abandon all your negativity, right? And if you want happiness in the future, it is very good to establish the causes of that happiness, which is virtue. So basically, we establish refuge and together with that, the law of cause and effect. So when we say the law of cause and effect is the basic advice of abandoning negativity and establishing virtue. How do we understand negativity? You can say that negativity is any action of your body, speech and mind that harms you and others. And as for virtue, like again, a very simple definition, you can say it's any activity that benefits you and others. All right, so abandon the negative, establish the positive. And that becomes our basic practice. It is the foundation of our practice, right? The practice is common with the individual of the small scope. That's the foundation of our practices. Okay, so we have explained the practices that are common with the individual of the small scope. And then after that, we move into the next phase, which is practices that are common with the individual of the middle scope. So in the previous phase, when we, you were doing the practices of the small scope, you were afraid of the suffering that comes if you fall into the lower migrations. And in a sense, you know, you're having the wish that if only I could get a good rebirth, like higher rebirth as a god or a human and so forth. Here, when you engage the practices that are shared with the individual of the middle scope, you understand that even if I'm born as a, as a god, 
right? Or even if I get a higher rebirth. The thing is that there is no guarantee. There's no stability. I take this rebirth, then I have to die. I have to migrate to another rebirth. And again, I fall into a state of suffering and negativity. So you understand that any type of rebirth within samsara is actually perpetuating the situation of uncertainty and of falling again into states of suffering and into periods where you engage negativity more intensively. So you say, you know, I have to be completely uh, free from this samsaric state because as long as I'm in it, there is no guarantee, there is no stability. So this is how you generate that sense of renunciation where you say i have to completely overcome this contaminated state of aggregates that is appropriated through karma and affliction so number one you generate renunciation and the second aspect in this uh, type of training is that you engage the three higher trainings so the training of ethics, of concentration, and wisdom. So renunciation and the three types of training are the two main features of the path of the practices that are shared with the individual of, this, of the medium scope. Okay. All right. Um, we come now to the unique practices of the individual of the great scope. So when you were still doing the training that is common to the individual of the middle scope, you were so much preoccupied about yourself. Like you were saying, I want to be free from samsara. I want to be free from samsaric suffering, right? But then suddenly you realize that you're not alone. There are all these other sentient beings. And in a sense, they're all similar to yourself. They don't want to experience any any suffering either so you start developing this uh, thought to this feeling that actually you know it is not okay if it is if I'm only preoccupied about my only happiness only about my liberation so you start thinking that they have been kind to me in various occasions and even they say they have played the role of a mother to me so countless times over and over again in many occasions they have been very kind to me therefore it's inappropriate if if I'm only occupied, preoccupied with my own happiness. I also need to bring happiness to all those sentient beings. However, realistically, right now, I do not have the power and the capacity to definitely benefit and make happy all those sentient beings. And unless I reach the state of Buddhahood, I will not be able to do it. Therefore, come what may, no matter how difficult this is, no matter how long it will take, I will reach the state of Buddhahood in order to benefit all mother sentient beings. So when you reach to the point where you have such a thought and such an aspiration, you have what we say the mind generation, which is the mind of bodhicitta. Okay, so this is one main feature. And once you have generated the mind of bodhicitta, then obviously you have to engage in the practices of the bodhisattvas. So these are the two main features of the unique path of the individual of the great scope. So in this way, Geshe-la has presented in a concise way the essence of the lamrim, of the stages of the path. And we have been talking for one hour Okay, so we have come to the conclusion of this presentation. Geshe-la does not wish to uh, have it any longer for today. So we're now going to have the 15 minutes where you can ask your questions or, you know, exchange this. If you have any ideas you want to share, any comments, questions, and so forth. Ling Chong, Bola, we will need you to help translate to Gishila. So Ling Chong, could you please uh, read your, uh, say your question to Bola and Bola will translate. Mute. Ling Chong is mute. All right, just coming up. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Hello, Gishila. Thank you for giving all the teachings. Long time never see you. Hope the next time you can see back in Singapore and all more teachings. 
Okay, yeah. my question is uh, when you are sharing uh, with us the great scope to enlightenment, there is the mentioning about the uncommon practice and a common practice. Uh, con constantly we hear a lot of this uncommon practice and common practice. What do you mean by uncommon practice and common practice in terms of the uh, Dharma teaching? Okay, yes. Okay, yes. Okay, okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. 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 Di tumo wata tumo mai ba kare kare gone tumo wata tumo mai ba resa. Listen, we are using this term. We talking about the practices that are common with the individual of the small scope. If you just had an individual of the small scope, right? So we're not talking about the lumbering practitioner here. Just an individual of the small scope. It means you have a person who is afraid about the suffering of the lower migrations and therefore they might go for refuge and they might observe the law of cause and effect in other words observe an ethical conduct isn't it so their focus and what they want to achieve is just to avoid the suffering of the lower migrations however here in the lam ring we are talking about an individual who is aiming uh, to reach the state of Buddhahood. So they have a much bigger aim, a much bigger goal. So we say that this person who wants to reach there, they have to also engage um, the training that this individual who is afraid of the lower migrations does. So it becomes common training, common to those who are only have this limited interest and common to those who are looking to attain the state of Buddhahood, all right? Similarly, we use this term common training with the individual of uh, the middle scope because the main training of, let's say, the individual, just the individual of the middle scope, they are preoccupied with themselves personally to avoid the suffering of samsara. But if you are thinking of reaching the state of enlightenment, definitely you have to undergo this training. You have to have this shared training, training that is common to them, and you also have to train in renunciation and in the three types of training. So then if we look at the training of the individual of the great scope, we see that everything that comes prior to this, it's almost like preliminaries so that they can do the practices of the individual of the great scope. So in that sense, it is common, it is shared to those people who have also very limited interest for certain areas. Thank you, Isela. Okay, so the question was uh, how do we gradually progress? How do we actually begin to practice, right? So Geshe says in order to begin your practice, first of all, you must know, you must understand. And in order to understand, you must come to listen, you must receive teachings. So I think it, it is very good, or well, the starting point is to come to listen to the teachings from the beginning to the end, right? So from the beginning, the first subject, how to properly rely on the teacher, all the way down to obtaining the union of calm abiding and special insight. So it's very good in the beginning to develop a concise understanding, right? This is the entire path, not in detail, but briefly, this is what it is. Once you have certainty on that understanding, then you start going every subject bit by bit by bit. 
and go a bit deeper. So this is how you will get us as a thing. This is the best way to engage this practice. Yeah. Okay, Gisela, thank you so much. Um, our question is finished. Tanda Chewa Tas. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Then, uh, oh, yeah, can, yeah, yeah. We can. Uh, oh, yeah. Is there anyone who has any feedback or anything? Otherwise, mm. we can all switch on our cameras to say our appreciation <laughs> to Gisela and uh, just to really thank Gisela. Um, can I invite one of the. Uh, translator to translate to Geshe Lao. Um, maybe uh, Bola, because I'm more fluent in English, I think. Bola, so can you help me translate to Geshe Lao? Geshe Lao, thank you so much. We have had a very, very oh, yeah, good yeah. first session and uh, we're very um, privileged that you know, Geshe Lao is spending time to teach us on a relatively long-term basis and we look forward to attending this class um, on like a long-term basis. And um, we are so happy. It has been uh, seven to nine years since Geshla has taught in our the Dropen Lin family. So uh, we are really cherishing this opportunity. And uh, thank you, Geshla, for all his efforts and um, his, his motivation to benefit us along this path. Okay, so Geshla is saying thank you very much. I'm very happy from my side to be participating in this. As I said from the beginning, I don't have any profound realizations of the Lamrim. However, we all consider the Lamrim to be very precious, very important. So it is excellent that uh, you are giving me the opportunity to teach the Lamrim. And, you know, during this uh, outbreak of the epidemic, so it so happens that I have a break from all my other commitments. So it seemed that we have the perfect circumstances. And as in every occasion, you know, we are able to create merit. This is an opportunity to create merit. But if there were no listeners, there would be no need for someone to act as a teacher. So thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to act as a teacher and accumulate merit for myself. This is what Gesha is saying. He's very happy to have this opportunity.